Hospital Reprosar. So for those who don't know me, I'm Florian Festi. I'm uh, one of the RPM developers. And I've set up this workshop to collect a bit of uh, user feedback on basically what we are going to do in the next bigger round of features we are going to start after the distribution which shall not be named is uh, released. Um, so why we are doing this? The issue that has always plagued RPM is that the RPM developers are not really packagers. I mean, we do have packages, we do updates and stuff, but we are not really maintaining a huge set of packages, so we always, there's always a, a skewed uh, view on the RPM world from, from the packagers. And that's been sometimes more of a problem, sometimes less of a problem, but even the features we implemented like the last couple of years are, at least in my mind, maybe Hanu is a bit different on this, but um, it's, um, it's basically from the perspective of a user, basically from the installation process. So, well, there's all those scripts that are running and they are confusing and, and complicated and we don't like this, so we added uh, uh, file triggers. But it's not actually, at least in my mind, not from a uh, packager perspective. Yes, it simplifies packaging a lot, and of course that's a consideration. It's not like an accident that it simplifies packaging. But it's not been like the main focus on on many stuff we do. And obvious, obviously that's a problem. And so I thought, well, if I'm in flock, we can basically take the opportunity to get us some feedback and to, to, to get access to, to maybe stuff that we are missing. Um, the maybe as a prerequisite, so that the, uh, the interaction between RPM upstream and Fedora has always been an interesting one. So obviously <coughs> RPM is a very Red Hat project. We, I mean, we have two and a half people working on, on RPM and Fedora is basically, uh, from our point of view, the, the purpose of Fedora is being a test bed for the next RPM release. Um, maybe among some other minor things, but that's the main, main purpose of Fedora from our perspective. Um, and so, so there's, there's this weird um, interaction. For one, we are implementing something new and we have the feeling we should like push it into Fedora on the other hand. We are not really proud of Fedora. Yeah. And so we all, I always had a feeling that Fedora needs to have its own opinion on what it actually wants from its packaging system. It's not like our job to like tell uh, Fedora how packages should look like. But on the other hand, of course, we do. I mean, if we implement a new feature, that's what you get. It's not like you can choose, you can choose not to use it, which still makes me unhappy. I'm not looking at anything specific here, except maybe the tilde version compare. Um, but, so, so it's always been interesting. And that, that what, makes, what makes it even more complicated is that RPM, of course, is also the packaging system for a lot of other distributions. So it's very important for us not to look like we are a Red Hat or Fedora Center project. So we've been working very hard on this the last couple of years. I don't know who's long enough with this to know how things looked like 10 years ago, where the communication with upstream was not always <laughs> as it is today, but we've come a long way actually to, to, to present ourselves as an uh, upstream that's independent and open from input from all other distribution. That's right, something we stress a lot and it's very important and to have the trust of all the other um, distributions. And it has actually uh, paid off with uh, many other distributions coming back to our line of development. Uh, and so we're very happy with that. But still, Fedora is something special. And so I'm hoping for uh, more input from that. The thing I have a suspicion about, but I don't really know and I want to find out today is, I think that the 
packaging problem in general is not that interesting. I think the interesting thing is, in my mind, is there's like an like islands of packages that have special needs and do special things and that are probably worth looking into. Probably based on the languages that are in, that implement these packages, I hear there's a big uh, had a lot of work to to get Python from the Python 2 being the default to, to switch it over to Python 3. And I, my guess is there are a lot of other issues like that that, that are very um, time consuming and, and have special problems that probably or maybe um, need some support from RPM or at least um, maybe supported better than we are doing today. That's what I want to find out. So I hope you all have like your small pile of packages that and you can basically tell a story of what that package is about and what in what problems they run into. So this is being a workshop and the idea is that you work and I shop <laughs> for for ideas. And if you're all happy with how RPM works and your Packages are just fine. Will we be like done in like five minutes, which is also nice. If not, uh, we will take a break for coffee and then can continue for a second hour, depending on how this goes. I have actually no idea. We'll see. So maybe a few remarks on on, on features and RPM in general, and, and that may be good to, to get a discussion started. There's there, there are a couple of things that makes it difficult to add new features to RPM because they are opposing forces uh, dragging into different directions. One of this is, yeah, everyone has this small little feature they want to have to get rid of these one line or two lines in this one package that's really, really, really annoying. But we won't, and I can tell you why. Because at every feature we add, adds burden to all the packagers who need to know about it, who need to look it up if they encounter it. So um, having many small features that help with small things is actually um, adding a cost that we would rather like to avoid. I mean, we already have too many features, to be honest. Packages, packaging is already so complicated. There are already so many things you have to know about. And on top of that, you have uh, uh, packaging guidelines that don't only tell you what features that are, but how to use them, how to use them properly, which not to use, which not to use in a special way. So it's too complicated already. So, and we added a lot of features in the last year. So I'm hesitant to to add small features unless there's a really good use case for it, like either things that cannot be solved currently. <laughs> or that actually have an impact that, uh, uh, that outsets the additional weight, which, for example, uh, uh, file triggers clearly do. We have been able to shrink the size of all the spec files a lot with that, and, it's, and it justifies the, the, the additional feature, even if it's a bit complicated in its nature. Then there's another very interesting thing that I'm, I'm thinking about. This is where to put the control over what's happening. And there's basically three places that are fighting over or struggling over uh, over control what's happening. And that's for one, of course, RPM upstream, which does stuff and that basically creates law on how things happen and has the force of, of, of C code implementation behind it. Then there's the distribution, which is currently, in my estimation, the weakest part, because they are mainly uh, down to policy and, and, and goodwill of the packager. And then there's the packagers who are able to do things. And the, 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 the what makes it complicated is that there's justification to push the control out to the details. But on the other hand, you have add the burden of things being non-uniform and complicated and repeated all over the place. So um, to maintain something that's that's 
can be worked with it's important to basically pull back the control and centralize things and, and canonically create policies to unify and, and make things more uniform than they are and that's that's something I'm currently not too happy with um, uh, in a way that the, a lot of things are done in the distributions but are not shared between distribution where RPM is not like gaining control by, by, by a lot of force. And it's something I would want, that's probably not that much for this discussion, but, but in the long run I would have the distribution coming together closer and having share more of the, of the um, things like macro files and, and um, dependency generators and uh, basically rules how packages are done because this has run away quite a bit. We have put it, pulled that together to some extent, but it's of course an ongoing struggle um, to, to keep that back. <coughs> there was one other point on this that I just lost. Uh, maybe, I'll come to it. So that's basically my introduction. So I would start with basically collecting use cases and packages. And uh, so maybe start a bit with who I'm talking to, who is not maintaining any packages. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, what happened to that guy? <laughs> <Rise ahead. laughs> so who was pretending five or less? Uh, Probably. Five or less? Maybe. Ten or less? Twenty or less? Fifty or less? One hundred or less? More than one hundred? <laughs> Okay, so we have basically the whole, whole, whole set of involvement. So who has a set of packages he wants to uh, showcase? Anyone? What was the question? So the question is, are there sets of packages that are special in some way and that may be interesting to look at for additional support to make them packaging easier? That's the main theme of the day. Anyone? The Golang package. The Golang. Okay. So, what's the problem with that? Or what? What? If, what's the challenge? So uh, right now, if uh, if a Golang package has a lot of modules and all this stuff, you have to do each and everything. Even you have the language types. So then, how? It, I mean, if you already have the language types, they are part of your source. So then, why we have to add? So you're basically duplicating a lot of. Uh, so there's a there's an automatic generated spec file from the for the Golang packages. Yeah. Uh, that's actually basically add whatever the it relates to the all the source files of the Golang and it's actually looking at every module as part of the spec file, which is already part of the render right? yeah. So that has a, a spec generator. And it duplicates all the information that we already have. Uh, yes, so it, it, it has, uh, it has the, all the model information which are already part of one of the directories usually used for doing the build process. Okay, so is this something that actually puts burden on the packager or is this just annoying? Uh, it doesn't because it's automated. So it's automated. Yeah. But it basically uh, duplicates. Uh, it's a general problem not only for Golang. We have multiple tools to generate spec files. For <coughs> either Python, Ruby, maybe Rust. And uh, there is a lot of things that is automatically generated when you add the package to the distribution and then when you update it you either generate it again for the new version and then compare it or you just update the version and hope for the best and then if it doesn't build you add the missing build require 
but you sometimes forgot to remove the obsolete one. And like having a way to either have automatic build requires, which is something that I think there is an issue for it on GitHub, or even more, having something that would generate the spec file as a thing that we don't maintain anymore, yeah. uh, that would be also very... So it's basically a, a, a build uh, system issue. So basically, we have a lot of software that would generate an RPM spec file automatically, but we are assuming they are edited by hand, basically. Yeah. And then the problem is basically to integrate this into the uh, build service or the build system and the build workflow. Okay. So uh, generators. So the question I have is, is, of course, RPM obviously cannot do anything about the workflow which is outside of RPM, but I'm wondering if the problem is we, we actually do manual work with, with, uh, with RPMs, of course, like doing updates, backporting, patches. So how, do, how does it work here? So, so this is a mixed workflow, so you, you rerun this if you update, if you do a rebase, but you do also manual work on this, or is this basically, could you actually just automate this for me? It's a question I, I'm asking. I would say that currently it's not 100% automated. Yeah, the question is, could it be automated? Or do you actually have to still like put patches in? It could be automated if there is a way you say, okay, take the upstream metadata, generate the spec file or the package directly, whatever, and this is what I add for it, like okay. a, like a patch for the spec file or additional data or additional steps or something. Yeah. So so if you have a perfect upstream, yep. it could be automated. So we could uh, get upstreams and, and patches. Yeah. So we so patch, patch I mean, the we want the patches so thing because that's basically what RPM from the build side is about. It's basically about putting patches on top of something else. Um, and building. Yeah, and then build it, Testing, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and build it and stuff. Yeah, we do a few other things, but but the main but the main design thing from an art, from the spec file thing is having the the tar ball and then doing some patches which are separate and extra. So the trick here would be basically find a way to put in the patches and probably the change log associated with them, and on and insert that back into a uh, regenerated spec file. Mm. Okay, that's something to, 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 to chew on. Another uh, idea. Uh, well, Stack Overflow is full of questions like, okay, I got pip install full, get install full. Why RPM doesn't know about my library? I said, of course, the answer is obvious. Um, yeah. uh, but the question is, why we couldn't do something like RPM um, dash dash I forcefully install using pip something like this so let manually insert py uh, Python uh, parentheses something and, and the parentheses so well, why not? I think you just could you would probably need root, root for that so one of the problems, of course, that all those installers are basically run as, as user, which is a tricky thing for RPM, especially if you have like... Well, we can start at yeah. user uh, root install this yeah. module, so, so instead no, I'm of just, yeah, creating sure. dummy, dummy CI yeah. file and, and inserting, I will just run some command and RPM will insert it into RPM da database. Ideally, with some tag that okay, this doesn't come from any RPM mm -hmm. and was installed using pipe uh, or gem or some uh, local tool. Technically, probably isn't that difficult. I think yeah. we have not done it because it's basically a bit of out of scope for RPM and development. Yeah. So the question is for stuff like this, the question who's actually doing that? So that's that's also something that. That's an interesting problem for RPM right now. 
the question is what actually is RPM, which is actually part of the different languages surrounding it. So we, is, we still have a lot of uh, dependency generators in the RPM package itself. And the question is, do they really belong there or do you actually would want them, would have like the Python dependency generator be part of Python or be part of something in between? Well, the use case is that uh, uh, I have some application which requires Python dash full, uh, but for some other application, uh, I, I need Python full to be uh, the most recent one. Yeah. Why the the, the first application requires what? any? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Obviously, use case for modularity, but let's step aside from that. Uh, so so uh, when you install uh, Python full from upstream. Then RPM doesn't know about it, so the fir first application doesn't have the uh, entry in RPM database. Uh, so you are somehow stuck and say, why does it work? So that's the usual question on the on the stack overflow. Okay. Uh, basically, as far as I understand, the days make RPM somehow aware of the non-RPM install files from wherever, and. Uh, I know some sort of maybe integration with all the language specific package manager like package managers like I think wrap around them, which would be of course something that not burden for our stream and so on, <coughs> but I really think it would be useful from the user perspective because those packages we already know that you're not supposed to install packages or things with like language specific yeah, yeah. package managers, they're not they do not play very well in the system. Yeah. But if somehow RPM was able to recognize, you know, it's not coming from uh, the repositories or anything, or if it's part of the installation from our language specific package manager, it would make things a lot easier and it would promote uh, creation of various tools also around it. So, yeah, I think it might be very long scope, but definitely a very a use case that applies to many people, way too many people uh, at this time. So, well, they're just. We had this in a similar, uh, in a different context, and the question was if you could actually force RPM to actually look on the disk what's there, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's currently not done. Basically, traditionally, to like enforce people to not install stuff otherwise, and there's of course an argument to be made that's kind of the right thing, but maybe not. But it's it something like OP. I mean, I've seen. People trying to sort of run scripts to figure out what is not owned by yep. RPM to yep. find out what has been installed in the system. But everyone on the internet, if you are a new developer or anything, you will find instructions on how to use language specific yeah, yeah, managers. Sure. So there's gonna users are gonna keep Did going up their system to do that. Hmm? Did you want to do slides? No. Okay. Because I brought a dongle. All right. <laughs> no, we're fine. Okay. Thank you. We're getting back yes, there, there are a couple of things that, that can be done. So, so the, the reason we've not done it is because it's, it's in a weird space in between RPM and the tools and, and whatever. But I understand that that's an issue, and we will I will probably try to figure out how to burden with that. One more thing, which is totally really related. So basically, if we can generate some packages automatically, we could have some patterns. Uh, for example, if there is some uh, something like a user the Python seven side packages, whatever, then generate Python to full sub package with, with some special provides. So basically after that we could just teach RPM or some any other tool, uh, just to read the file system, find those files which are not owned by any packages and then just run those generators and basically record. So basically you have um Package patterns. So the idea was 
basically to have uh, patterns that from files on disk that would be turned into uh, packages that can be installed to basically tell the RPM database, well, you have, you have these, pack these um, Python packages installed from, from different sources and stuff like this. This would have the, the benefit of not relying too much on the package format of the library, uh, of the languages, but you could instead basically just say, well, these are the locations we're interested in. If we encounter some of them, we will just pick them up and then tell, tell the database, well, that's what we got. The problem so with that <coughs> is if you update one of those packages using some other system than DNF, everything will break because it depends on the older version. Yeah. The, well, the problem with, with this is, so, I mean, that's generally the problem if you have like multiple sources for packages that are not managed uh, in a centralized w way that is basically you get outdated. I mean, if you if you install if you do pip install and then delete it from a disk, it's gone, and no one knows about it. I mean, yeah, if you just delete it from disk and you install it with RPM, it's also just gone. But yeah, no one does that. I mean, and if you do it, uh, not not that, but you yeah, but but we don't care about those people. <laughs> But um, uh, but it's more it's do. more it's more likely to happen if you have like a second secondary tool that actually does that and updates it and replaces it in the background. Of course, it's probably as a from a company that this is just a stuff that is I would say that it's a high risk of uh, a customer doing something dangerous like that. Uh, you just try to install and make it some uh, improved workaround. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm a bit afraid of that. Yeah, yeah, you should be. We all should be. <laughs> but but the, the thing is, the, the thing is, what's what's the what's the proper use of something like this? Yeah, if you have a production machine and you do something like this, yeah, you probably deserve hell, and uh, you will find yourself in there quite quickly. But yeah, if you're the problem is that the customer does it, and we are in the problem. Yeah, that that's that's a problem. But but I mean. For a developer that basically just sets up his small project and says, well, it was the fastest way of getting it. No, 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 no. That way they just post the Stack Overflow question later when it actually breaks. Yeah. It doesn't really solve them. doesn't really solve them. If, if they already know how they should do it, they, they're they fine. They just install IPM. You know? Yeah, if it's available. If it's available or make a virtual environment or just yeah. do it the proper way. I mean, I mean, to solve this properly, it would basically mean hacking into those uh, uh, packaging systems and basically synchronize from there to the database. Well, I, I think you could solve it by creating the RPM based on the upstream format and then installing it as yep. an RPM yep. and calling that to pip or chem or whatever. Yep. That way, you know, if RPM is, you know, feature-wise a superset of all the other ones, that could be possible, but I don't really see a way to to hack around the update problem by mixing repositories, like mixing yeah. package databases. If you want this to really work live, you have to do it properly. That's the story of RPM, unfortunately. <laughs> if any of those language-specific install mechanisms have any sort of centralized database, for tracking what it is put in, because most of these tools also want you to use that tool to yeah. take it out, and not to have you go randomly deleting files on the file system. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's far more likely that a user who is done with a component like that is going to do the tool that they use to take it out. Yeah. If we can, and again, I'm not speaking in specifics here, but if that tooling has a database that says this is what I have put in on the system. It would be very valuable if RPM could directly query that database in a standardized language in a way so that if a user used that tool to install something, that RPM can at least expose that information of what that other database says it has. We have to trust it to a certain extent because that other tool is trusting that. Yeah. So, so one problem with that, uh, RPM is actually really nice 
Python's pip doesn't have a depth solver, so if you okay. update something, you break your system and uh, And again, it, it's not going to work for every single one of those systems. It's going to have to be looking at those ecosystems and saying which of these are built sanely in a way where we can an get answers to these questions. Uh, some of them probably are. I haven't spent a lot of time tearing them apart to try and glue them into RPM, but uh, I would wager, based on what I've seen from Go, that uh, there's a possibility of being able to pull from its transaction history and being able to do reasonable data generation back so we can see what Go files are littered all over that place. Uh, well, and you said that it doesn't have dependency uh, or I mean, so well, it's, a, it's the way that right now we couldn't do anything about it. So uh, again, uh, we will provide you a uh, gun and it's up to you to shut your to life or you are you know what you are doing. So if, if we do something uh, and if you do know what you are doing, you can do something. If you don't know, no, you shoot yourself in, into life or into the body. Well, that's that's the problem we're trying to solve here. You know? yeah, so yeah, stack yeah. overflow questions from people who don't know and have shot themselves in the foot. If that's not a problem, then we're done. I mean, clearly the problem is that we can't possibly package everything. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, and thus, how do we how do we have these two ecosystems that are mixing? Yeah. How do we how do we minimize the pain for people who are mixing these ecosystems? And mm -hmm. what understanding that we cannot necessarily change the PIP ecosystem, we can certainly suggest changes, and they can tell us to go pound sand. Uh, but what can we do on the RPM side to uh, minimize the pain that a user or a developer will feel? I mean, I mean the question also is um, even if people have like. PIP installed something and say, well, RPM doesn't find it and my other stuff doesn't install, but I have it on the disk. Basically, having a way of reinstalling this properly through an RPM build thing on the right place on disk is probably a good so enough solution to actually not use the one thing they put somewhere in their home directory. But to say, well, I mean, the problem is even if they ask a question, you can say, well, just do DNF install something, but it's not helping if the stuff is not available. I mean, that that's, if it, were, if it were all available as a package, it wouldn't be a big deal to say, well, you did pip install, it just is. just typing again with another prefix. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't do it with sudo. All the notorious everywhere. Yeah. I, you know, books which actually suggest yeah. you install something. Yeah, but, it, but the actual problem is that telling people just use DNF won't help them because most of the stuff is actually not packaged. Yeah. So we need a solution that actually will put uh, everything basically that's available on PIP on the disk somehow in the same way. I don't think try to solve this from the RPM side, the problem is a good solution. So there is an for PIP, because that's all I know. I don't know how yeah. PMs and other things work. There is an upstream issue that if we install stuff in RPM packages and mark it as installed by RPM, <coughs> which is there is a way, there is an installer file that could say PIP or DNF or RPM or whatever, uh, PIP could behave in a way that if it tries, if the user tries to sudo PIP upgrade a package that was not installed by PIP but by some distribution package management, the PIP would refuse until that dash force or something. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it could tell you, you don't do this, instead do something else. And the something else doesn't necessarily mean do DNF install because we know we can't package everything. It could tell you use a virtual environment or use dash dash user to install it to your home directory or whatever. And I think this is a better solution for PIP than to try to hack around it on the RPM side. On the other hand, it means we would need to solve it for PIP, then we need to solve it for RubyGems, then we need to solve it for CTAN, then we need to solve it for whatever else is there. And it, it's a lot of work. And every each of these ecosystems and installers is different. Mm -hmm. And the fix would work in a very different way. But trying to like comprehend this from the RPM side, like guessing, oh, this looks like a PIP installed package because of this, yeah. then do something different. Kind of hackish, at least yeah, in my eyes. I agree. 
And that's probably the reason why we've not really looked into it, because the proper solution is probably coming from all those different domains that need to offer a solution on their own. Yeah. Well, well uh, Lukash probably suggested that we can have like something like Fedora PIP, and you will call PIP to install something, and then we'll put something into, into RPM DB, for example. Then, so so RPM will just or have or to maybe DNF plugin. Like yeah, DNF but we need yeah. to somehow put something into RPM. Yeah. So so at least you you don't need to provide it for the RPM command. You just need to provide something in RPM lib library, so I can call RPM lib and say, okay, I somehow install it. Uh, I'm, I'm some putting something into into RPM DB. Uh, you will mark it as installed by external application. Yeah, the, the and, and everything will be done in those application and not RPM. Yeah. You just provide way how to. The, the problem currently is there's just basically a matrix of, of, of problems. You have the different languages on the one hand, on the other hand, you have the different uh, uh, packaging systems on the distribution side also. It's not like we have to tell the Python people, well, do this for RPM and everything is good. No, no, there's Debian people coming and who else who will basically make come up with the same demand. So I think there's still some untangling to do to actually probably basically have an interface in the middle where you can basically merge uh, both sides onto each other without having the full uh, complexity of, of, of all combinations. I would probably want to stop this discussion here and look for other packages because, I mean, it's a very interesting thing and we still have, well, I don't know, one and a half hours and we can pick it up later on. But I would rather have more looks into different packages in Fedora, actually. Uh, if just something before about the Python packages, basically. Yeah. So do you have any specific questions there or do you want us to leave? Whatever you want, the main package, uh, the main question I have is, I have is, what do we need to m do to make the Python three to Python four transition more easy? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very simple answer to this: <laughs> never do Python four. Yeah, that, that, that's not. <laughs> but uh, also, modules should really help with this. I think. Yeah. I, I, I don't. I don't think you need to do stuff at the RPM level. If modules are ready at that time, uh, which they it, it better will be it depends on the date, right? Yeah, <laughs> modules will solve all of them, even yeah. the ones we don't have. Oh. So, uh, I'm just trying to define like what have you seen maybe from our side? I can't quite call uh, if there's like packages or the transition, like is it the sub package issue or anything like that? Uh, I actually package? don't know, I'm asking you. Okay, so. Uh, what I don't like is that RPM upstream makes a lot of assumptions about Python itself. Like yeah. there is user from Python, this is the Python, and this is the only Python everything should use, and then you can use X to work around this. One example is the automagic byte compilation thing, yeah. where everything that happens to be called dot .py uh, is byte compiled by user from Python, which is completely bogus assumption. Yep. And then if you need to change this on the on the distro level, there is no clear way where would we do this? Because there is RPM upstream, then there are patches in the RPM package of RPM and Fedora, and then there is Red Hat RPM config. And then you somehow have to squeeze all these three things and something comes out of it, and then RPM upstream changes something a little bit, and then it's defined in two different ways. And it again is again not working. So, yeah. so, so the main problem is that RPM, and <coughs> this is maybe a good thing, generally or bad, I don't know, is trying to do stuff that I think the distro should decide how it should work. However, several distros might want to share this. So it's a, it's a two-way problem. Yeah, that, that's something I actually wanted to, to before, and so so that that's something that's very interesting for me. So so the question is how how to solve this.
my initial idea basically would be to split the Python handling out of RPM upstream and make this a project on its own that would probably live on GitHub just beside of RPM and that people from different distribution could have access to. And of course we would, as RPM maintainers, help with all the technical stuff, but we are actually not that interested in getting into the policy decisions on how those packages are, are created or <coughs> processed or packaged. Because we just don't know and we actually don't want to know, if I'm completely <laughs> honest. So this is something that would appeal to you, like mm -hmm. splitting it out, having a separate package. I mean, basically having 10 separate packages. Yeah. One, of, one of this would be Python and probably all the other dev languages could, could have their own uh, uh, repository and their own project, basically. We started having an, an RPM Extras repository, which has not really taken off and we've not put in enough work to actually get it somewhere to basically push everything into that we don't want upstream, but basically needs to go somewhere at least, other than some packages and some distros where no one else cares, but this one guy that maintains the package. Um, but that, that's, uh, that's something I would push for in the next year or something. It feels like it's something that would clarify the distinction Packages. At the same time, I don't really see a use case where I would want all the extras to be stored together with RPM. Yeah, yeah this, so is not so much, this is yeah. not so much about not installing them, although that could be interesting to actually not installing them in build groups that don't need them. But for me, it's more a question of who is in control and mm -hmm. who's, who has ownership over the code or the, the, the settings. Yeah, it would make sense from that. And and RPM upstream just can't deal with all the different languages and be proficient in how in all the details. And I think it would be good to leverage the knowledge from the distributions, but not I I don't want to hand over this to you because I know you will change something and the SUSE people will change something else and uh, yeah. there are a couple of other distributions and after like two months we have five different versions of Python dependency generators that all do different things. So who's going to be reviewing that stuff? I mean, the RPM people are going to be, like, sort of have the leadership role. Yeah, we will we'll still, I mean, we will not abandon that. I mean, we will still probably even own the repository. Yeah, trying to figure out there's a fine line between, like, not sort of uh, melting too much the project, but also uh, defining the roles of other people who contribute to the project. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, things are complicated. Deal with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's not that <laughs> that's, that's, that's basically the answer. But it would at least um, like set up the proper uh, uh, boundaries on, on how it's supposed to work and then you can still hit each other over the head between the distributions. And I'm fine, I'm not, I, I'm fine with different distribution doing different things. Mm -hmm if they know what they're doing and they have reasons. I mean, there's a reason why they do have different distributions. They have different, they are supposed to make different design decisions and to, 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 to strive for different things. But having difference just on the different things, that's, that's not the game we want to play. Yeah. Mm. On a similar note, um, I recently hit a uh, few very last uh, with RPM build, um, if something failed with RPM build during prep, install, or build phase, it's fine. It's quite easy to find in debug. But once you hit um, uh, the, the hook phase, where Python dependency are mm, generated, mm -hmm. uh, checks are run. Uh, it's like kind of magic, even the dog face. Uh, uh, because in the right something like uh, running running dog, per person dog, uh, uh, or entering dog face, uh, running uh, script 
slash emp slash and some random numbers. And the script obviously doesn't exist in the time because it's created and immediately deleted. Uh, and if it fails in this phase, you basically don't know why. Because even for the Python generators, it doesn't say it's running Python generators mm -hmm. or it's running this check. So it will probably help me personally so if this phase would be more verbose. Yeah. Like I'm running this check and for example where I can find the script or where where I can find the generator. Uh, so I can say, okay, this actually failed in this script or somewhere. Yeah, actually it's not magic, it's actually black magic. So there's, <laughs> there's actually a chicken sacrifice every time you run it. Yeah. Basically, somewhere else, of course. So, so I would like, like to know well which chicken yeah. I have to Yeah, but, but the thing is, there are a couple of places in there that are really more cold and there are code that really needs to be revisited at some point. We rewritten most of the most places in RPM since I joined like 10 years ago, but uh, in RPM build there's still a couple of places that are basically, mm -hmm. I don't know how old. Get blame you probably know, but pretty old, and all those stuff that needs to be <laughs> cleaned up at some point. Especially we like we talked about this earlier, like the build rule policy scripts, which are uh, there are a couple of other things in there which are quite interesting. Um, but I would to want to continue on the on the per language stuff. So, so first is, are there other languages that, that, that would be interested in actually maintaining their own stuff within our, our beside RPM? Is there anyone else there than, uh, other than Python? We have our own repo for Rust. So we have all the generators, all the tools in there. So Rust already is basically set up this way. Is it the Fedora specific thing or you share it across uh, the Actually, the nice thing about prospecting is that basically uh, we took some gu uh, one guy from Magia, I'm from Fedora, uh, one other guy from OpenSUSE, and basically we discussed how we want to see the thing and basically uh, I create the code. Yeah, it's easier if you actually do it the first time. Yeah, properly. If you have something for it's, three it's years. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem with, with all those, mm -hmm. those fun. That you have to maintain for at least two decades at least. So, does that maintain somewhere separately, like your own rep or something? Uh, it's actually on Figure Federal Rust Trust or VM or something like this. Yeah. yeah. I may <coughs> ask you to move to GitHub if we set up more of those, but for now it's fine. Okay. Ruby, Ruby Gems have generators as well. How are they, where are they packaged? Oh, I don't know from top of my head. I'm, I'm not in, uh, involved. I just know it from the point of view. So okay, so so it's also somewhere in Fedora. Uh, yeah, get get to spec. Okay. There is also no JS stuff, which is also not the top figure. So there is no JS packaging or something like this. Okay. But but this is a the this is a spec generator, Ruby, yeah. which is not quite the same as the dependency generators we've been talking about. Just to clarify, uh, yeah, okay. because I mean, there's nothing wrong like having oh, them, yeah. having them in a repository, but it's it's they're one more step removed from <coughs> RPM than independent generators, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But just just to 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 know what we are talking about. What's RPM's take on the spec generators generally? Like there are various tools projects that are outside of RPM, obviously. So. They are basically all outside of RPM, and they are basically not within our scope. Yeah, okay. Basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So people that are involved in, in, in RPM development are actually not involved in any of them. That's two problems. One is that you cannot really specify in RPM, like my build system is Mesol, and then RPM should figure out the how to start the build section, install section, and all the stuff. It would be really nice if we would have some build system, right? build system CMake, and it would do all the tricks inside. And the second problem is obviously a journey of some packages, because we need some packages. 
tools, well, and also automatic uh, build requires, then you don't need any external generators because you don't you have nothing to generate actually. So you would there are a couple of things to, to consider. And the first thing is uh, do we have multiple build modes or do we have like multiple subdirectories and build modes? And if we have we pr could probably expand that the, the Macros, the macros, I mean setup is not really a macro. It's a it's another magic thing, probably with a different color kind of, of, of chicken. Um, but we could basically expand it multiple times. Well, usually you don't need multiple tools, probably. Uh, for instance, in my use case, I want to basically have macro like a meson system which uh, defines uh, meson as a build install <coughs> and check and then sometimes you also want to install some additional files from that mm. so you could maybe create a macro in a way that it does this in some kind of like there's OS install post and we could have hooks for every section like pre-build yeah, and post-build and pre-install and post-install and you would actually have yeah, and then you would in that macro put it everything in the pre-built and pre-install, and if install is empty, it does nothing and it doesn't shout on you, which is probably not the current case. I'm not sure, but it does the build, and if you manually add install, uh, it executes after the pre-install and it's a bit. Maybe if you have like multiple, like you want to build one thing, then install second thing, and then you have third thing. Uh, you already find all those macros and it gets really ugly. Yeah. Uh, especially with the OS info port, you just already find whole macro. It's all. Excuse me if I interrupt, I have a question of order. Do you take the question? Yeah, I don't have a time. Well, what, what's the time? It's uh, 25 past now. 825. When's the, when's the coffee break? 825. Then we have, we're, we're, doing the, we're doing the coffee break. <laughs> So, is there anything to, to conclude this? Or can we just head out for coffee? I think it was a good brainstorm. So, so we have coffee a break. We'll start break like. Coffee break is like 20 minutes, right? We'll. We'll start.